Broadcasting live, it's America's longest running talk show on computers. It's Computer America, bringing you the biggest names in technology with guest interviews, new products, and your emails. Listen live at ComputerAmerica.com on any device around the world. Email the show at live at ComputerAmerica.com or find us on social media. Be sure to check out our website for contests, giveaways, show notes, live video stream, podcasts, and more. You're listening to Computer America. Hello and welcome into the Computer America Show. We are the nation's longest running, nationally syndicated radio talk show on computers and technology. Thank you for joining us. I'm your host, Ben Crossman, and everyone out there, thank you so much for tuning in. Uh, if you're listening to us on IRN, thank you, thank, thank you so much. If you're listening to us on the podcast, the video feed, however it is that you tune into Computer America, we thank you so much. Uh, today on the program, we have computer and technology news. Uh, we have a lot of different stories. I think the first uh, big chunk of the show is going to be dedicated to a very important topic that uh, comes up here occasionally on the show but it's it's reaching uh it's really reaching a pitch and i think it's time that we just talk about it you know kind of head on because we've talked about this with uh with a couple of our correspondents and we kind of touch on it when certain uh, topics come up but it's re it really feels like it's uh it's taking it to another level so we're going to talk about that in just a moment and uh everyone again welcome into the program let's go ahead and just say computeramerica.com if you have never checked out our website we highly encourage you to lots of articles lots of reviews lots of uh, past shows future shows show notes if there's anything in the program that we talk about here today that you want to find out about that is the exact place that you want to go computeramerica.com find us on social media at computer america wherever social media is uh you know whichever social media that you happen to use uh, i'm sure that we have a social media account there tied to it now that being said uh let's see so a couple things to get out of the way as well uh we have signed up with an affiliate program with uh <laughs> actually kind of a personal favorite of mine um, you know we haven't really done too many affiliate things in the past before but I'm you know going to start uh, doing more of those here on computer America so you know for better or worse be sure to reach us out and reach out and let us know but I'm actually a huge fan I tried it you know I, I got it as a gift uh, a couple of months ago and I absolutely love this product and so I decided, you know, I'll reach out, get in touch with them, and turns out that uh, we now have our own promo code. We have a link bo below the Twitch stream, twitch.tv forward slash Computer America. We'll put it up on our website somewhere, but in the meantime, you can use the promo code Computer America, all caps, all one word, uh, over at Cannonball Coffee. If you've never had Cannonball Coffee, I'm sure that a lot of people out there are avid coffee drinkers. Uh, I've always treated coffee like medicine, where uh, just to get through my day, I would have a cup of black coffee and just wait for it to warm up to room temperature, or I should say cool down room temperature, and just kind of shoot it. But Cannonball Coffee was one of the first coffees that I've had that was actually really good so i felt no no quibble no trouble uh, you know uh signing up for the affiliate program and again if you use uh promo code computer america hey we get a little bit of kickback and you get to have some really awesome coffee so again link uh, link below the stream but uh yeah even even if you don't use uh the computer america promo code cannibal coffee highly recommended huge amount of caffeine if if that's not your bag if you drink coffee for the flavor you'll love it but it also if you drink for, for the caffeine content then cannibal coffee is definitely where you want to be 
give it a look uh also we also have something in the works uh we'll announce that in just uh probably in the next couple days but essentially we will be joining the affiliate program for stitcher as well so stitcher we've our show has been found on stitcher for years and years and years it's really a no-brainer uh they're one of the largest uh, podcast distribution services so check us out there uh stitcher.com forward slash computer america now all that being said, let's go ahead and get started with computer and technology news. We have a ton of different things. And again, um, last but not least, I guess I should also make a point to say thank you, thank you, thank you, IRN, for continuing to carry us. Uh, always a pleasure to bring our show to you however we can. So here we go. Computer and technology news brought to you by Computer America. So, I think our first story is going to be about drumroll. Let's see. Do I have a drumroll? I think I do. Yes, I do. Our first topic today is going to be about... Wait for it. Nice. China. China will be our first topic. And, you know, it's... uh, There is a lot about China that from a technology standpoint you don't have to like. They are huge on mass surveillance. They are huge on firewalls and banning. Uh, you know, certain kinds of content from the internet. Uh, there was a, there was a story a couple of days ago about the latest episode of none other than South Park. And I believe the title of the episode was Banned in China. You can kind of see where this is going. After statements that were critical of Ch- the Chinese government, uh, yeah, the in- the entirety of South Park disappeared from the Chinese internet. And don't you know, don't get it wrong, there are two versions of the internet. There's one for Chinese people, and there's one for the rest of the world. It's um, it's a very very wide gap between the two, and uh, it's increasingly for. What I personally believe uh, to be worse, it's increasingly bleeding over into a you know our kind of version of the internet. So the reason I, I wanted to dedicate a whole segment to this is because there have been some moves over the past couple of days. First one, of course, was the whole ban in China thing uh, from South Park, and of course, if you haven't read some of the responses from uh, Matt Zone and Trey Parker, you should definitely you know check that out. But essentially. China did not take too kindly to that. And then on top of that, there was this article, which if you're watching the video portion, we'll go ahead and throw it right on up there. But yeah, they're talking about the Houston Rockets manager tweeted his support for the protest in Hong Kong, fight for freedom, stand with Hong Kong. And this morning he, and this was, this article was uh, from, yeah, yesterday, uh, just shows you the you know the how fast this kind of thing happens but they were talking about hong kong and the protests there and the pro-democracy movement how uh the political climate in hong kong definitely go give that a look if you haven't been keeping up to date but essentially uh there have been moves by the ever influential chinese companies and by extension the chinese government to silence any kind of comments on the protest in Hong Kong, which freedom, you know, uh, every time one of these moves happens, there's this, there's always this sentiment that comes out, which is we appreciate free speech. And this is what the NBA said about the, the Houston Rockets manager, uh, you know, and he even had to post an apology to, uh, to, to, essentially uh the chinese companies that support his team uh essentially saying that uh there's always a statement that comes out from whatever governing body is above that institution uh for the head of the nba it was a statement saying that it it uh you know it completely will support free speech but they have already seen the economic impacts of making these statements and they don't think it's in the league's best interest to have these kinds of statements. That is the response time and time again, is that we love Chinese money. 
so we're going to go with that over the ideals of the country and, and really you know freedom of speech freedom of expression all that kind of thing obviously freedom of speech is not the same as freedom of consequence but there has to be a point where i know that we don't ask our companies to have a moral compass anymore that's you know to an extent when it plays when it plays well for them um you know whenever a company comes out in favor of lgbtq rights uh that's great whenever a company comes out in you know in eco-friendly terms that's great whenever a company you know determines that they're not going to uh you know uh support xyz because it's going to have this negative influence consumers really enjoy that but now we're also seeing companies they don't want to hurt their bottom line when it comes to the chinese market and it's going to come up a lot more which is why i really want to spend time talking about this is because this is not just one-offs it's not just the nba it's not just south park it's not just blizzard which we're going to get to in just a moment uh it's also hollywood and you know that's actually what south park was you know kind of poking fun at was that we are going uh Hollywood, I think it's reports by like 2022 or something like that. Uh, China is going to be the number one uh, profit for movies because they have so many people over there. If you want your co- if you want your movie to succeed, uh, it's going to have to do really well in the Chinese market, and therefore you have to play by their rules, including a censorship happy government. So let's go ahead and talk about this article from, from The Verge, and then we'll you know kind of throw in our uh, our own commentary here and there. But essentially, they say that American tech companies have had to deal with Chinese government censorship and surveillance rules for years. Google initially brought search to China by purging results about touchy topics such as the Tiananmen Square protest until the practice, uh, I'm sorry, until ending the practice by pulling out of China in 2010. And here's the thing, like on that part where Google did that they initially took their search engine to china because they saw the massive they saw the massive user base in china and what that would mean and what that would lead to when you have 1.3 billion people and a lot of them are up and coming and their economy uh has really been doing very very well you can see why google would want to position themselves but even they determined back then in 2010 it just wasn't compatible with what the search engine was you know anti-censorship pro freedom of speech that kind of thing blah 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 but even though they took this stance in 2010 my point is in 2018 or 17 it's been so long yet so short ago that google was working secretly with the chinese government on bringing a version of google to the to china called dragonfly uh Reports only leaked about that when developers were leaving the the project in droves because the developers for Google, uh, they just didn't feel it was ethically right to make a search engine. And, and that's the thing. It's like, you know, especially when you're an American tech company, a search engine is meant to help you find information, whereas developing a search engine for China was about not just finding information which it still has to do as basic function but it has to perfectly omit other information that they don't want spread and it has to continuously be used for censorship and propaganda that th- those are the rules of china and, and operating within china uh, the article continues on microsoft linkedin agreed to censor anti-government material in order to stay online and facebook and twitter have already been banned since 2009 when they helped citizens spread news about the deadly rides in xinjiang and that usually seems to be the way of it i, I mean when when i talked about at the very beginning about how there's a chinese internet and an internet for, for the rest of the world that's how it happens is that if these services don't don't comply completely with the government they're banned and a new version of that service uh you know either it be by do or it's you know any of these other chinese focused tech companies there's a reason that they don't make any kind of headway into the u.s market 
is because they don't want to. They only want to service China, and there's enough people there to sustain a large business. And, you know, hey, they're they're already working copacetically with the Chinese government, so they have a very secure position in that economy. Uh, beyond that, Apple removed pro-democracy songs by Hong Kong singers from its Chinese music store, and despite its commitment to privacy as a selling point, it moved some iCloud data to Chinese servers in order to comply with local laws, raising concerns about whether this might have a chilling effect on what data people feel safe storing. And for those of you who don't recall, when it comes to Apple and privacy, Apple is a very big proponent of privacy. But at the same time, if it's stored on Apple servers on iCloud, they will they will comply with any government, especially the Chinese government's uh, request for information because it's not on an individual device; it's on Apple's device, and they will comply with that. Just last week, Apple reportedly removed Taiwan's flag from its iOS emoji library in Hong Kong and Macau. Yeah, if, if it seems petty, that's because it is. To remove an emoji flag from iOS from certain territories just because the Chinese government does not want any kind of imagery or ability to... Uh, does not want to give anyone the ability to protest uh, in any kind of tangible way. Of course, people will always find a way, but they want to strike down as many ways as they possibly can. Uh yeah, so with that being said, obviously the, uh, you know, uh, there's this article focused again on, on the NBA, uh, the statement from the, uh, you know, from the higher echelons of the NBA, again, kind of mentioned that freedom of speech is great, but we don't condone this because we like Chinese money. It's very, uh, very important. So to tie that article in with another one, um, let's see, I think, yeah. Oh, and, and by the way, if you want to know the fallout from that whole session, this is an article from uh, this is an article from TechCrunch saying that Chinese firms Tencent, which is a huge problem, Tencent is just everywhere, uh, Vivo and CCTV suspended ties with NBA over the Hong Kong tweet. Think about that. Companies pouring millions of dollars into an organization will suddenly stop themselves just because yeah, you know, they had a single a singular tweet. Uh, let's see. So smartphone maker Viva, broadcaster CCTV, and internet giant Tencent said today that they're suspending all cooperation with the NBA, becoming the latest Chinese firms to cut ties with the league after a tweet from a Houston Rocket executive supporting Hong Kong's pro-democracy. So let's see. Th anything new to add to this about... Uh, Let's see, users on Twitter today reported that e-commerce giants Alibaba and JD.com appear to have taken a stand to searches in China for Houston Rockets and Rockets, which previously serviced NBA franchise products, now return no results. Think about that. That's the kind of internet that you're dealing with, where one person for an entire organization uh, tweets out one thing that the government kind of doesn't support, which is, again, this whole issue with Hong Kong and the demonstration and, and the protest, and suddenly all instances of Houston Rockets are wiped from the face of the internet. It's a very powerful tool that they have developed. Uh, they said that in an unrelated event, several Chinese services banned an episode of South Park, obviously, as we mentioned. Uh, in a statement mentioned Monday, the South Park creator said, uh, you know, hey, go find their tweet. So, that's the second, so that's still the first story. The second story I wanted to bring up. This one just happening today. The NBA stuff happened yesterday, and this goes a step further and is very, 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 very wrong. It, it's kind of hard for me personally because I love Blizzard. Like, Blizzard Entertainment is such a huge part of my history. I've you know, ever since I was like four years old, I was sitting in front of a computer playing Warcraft One. Uh, it's I've been with them for 25 years. It's you know they they were probably my favorite company, and I'm not going to say that this this one incident is going to stop me from playing Blizzard games. It's not going to stop me from boycotting or you know it's, it's not going to make me boycott or do anything like that. 
but it is going to make me raise my voice and demand some kind of response for why they did this. And, you know, they, they, they have their terms and why they did this, but I wanted a more nuanced response for why Blizzard did this. So, for, ev- for everyone not in the know about this, this article coming from Business Insider, although many, many, many publications that cover this, in the last couple of hours as this happened, uh, Blizzard Entertainment, they run a game called Hearthstone. Hearthstone is a is a deck building game where you play against an opponent, uh, cards, deck, whatever. If you want to go check out Hearthstone, go check out Hearthstone. But it's a pretty big game. They have tournaments on a competitive level to see, uh, obviously, who's the best at Hearthstone. And there was one in particular... Uh, I believe he was a, let's see, I think he was a, uh, a Chinese national. And Blizzard Entertainment, they hosted a Hearthstone tournament that this gentleman won. And during the kind of exit interview, um, you know, saying, hey, you know, good job competing. Do you have anything to say? Him and two commentators sat down and the winner, who is Blitz Chung, he spoke out in support of the Hong Kong protests that are happening during the post-game interview. The two commentators ducked their heads after he made the remarks, and, and by the way, that was not apparently the best route as seen by the Chinese government because they were fired as well. And here's the worst part. The winner of the tournament, and this was a fairly large tournament where I think he was due to receive twenty-five or fifty thousand uh, dollars, whatever the prize pool was for winning first place. He won the whole darn thing, and then he said these, you know, uh, he said, and they said these remarks in support of the Hong Kong protest, which I'm trying to find the statement right now, and let's see, liberate Hong Kong, revolution of our age. That was. Uh, that was what he shouted. So essentially, he was in support of you know what's happening with the demonstrations. The two commentators ducked their heads. They revoked his money. He, he won the whole thing, and Blizzard said that they would not pay him at all for winning the tournament. And then on top of that, he's banned for a year from competing in the game and when he and really if you think about it he's he's a professional video game player uh he's banned from his from his main sport so you know he has no ability to work he can't enter any other tournaments to earn money uh they banned him for a year and then on top of that they fired the two casters who are esports commentators saying that uh, blizzard will not work with them anymore according to the company so the player whose real name is Chung, uh, Chung Win Y was participating in the Hearthstone Grandmaster regular season, an esports tournament in which players play Hearthstone, which is, as we said, a turn-based online card game developed by Blizzard. So on Sunday, the esports publication tweeted out footage of the post-match interview on the official Taiwanese Hearthstone stream. Blizzard has since deleted the footage of the interview from its official channel. But of course, it's the internet. Nothing ever goes away. So you can definitely find it. And again, he, st- he stood up and shouted, Liberate Hong Kong, Revolution of Our Age. After the exclamation, the two casters, uh, you know, they did not want to get in the middle of that because they knew what would happen. The ramifications are obvious with them getting fired. And yeah. Saying that uh, Blizzard is a U.S.-based company. They have been for a long time. But Blizzard merged with Activision. And Activision took a huge cut. Or uh, they they took a lot of money when Tencent purchased, I think, like 20% of the company. Like Tencent is a huge, huge, huge uh, stakeholder. In Blizzard, so you can see that's where the Chinese ties, you know, kind of sink in. Uh, they said that Blizzard is a U.S.-based company where speech is protected by the First Amendment of the U.S. Constitution, but it also operates in authoritarian China thanks to a partnership with Tencent, as we mentioned. China issues only a certain number of game licenses a year. A U.S.-based company often partner 
with game companies in the country as a way to access the vast market and grow their sales, i.e. read that as money. The only reason they're doing this is because money. But partnerships like that are often lead to a lot of clash of values. And that is probably the best way I've heard it put. This is indeed a clash of values. So the situation highlights the thorny trade-off U.S.-based companies face when operating in China. It's a hugely profitable opportunity, but placating, there we go, there's the word, the Chinese government can require compromising on fundamental democratic values in ways that provoke backlash elsewhere in the world. And I think that's where that's where we are now is that that backlash has to happen and if you're wondering uh if you're wondering what part of blizzards you know kind of terms of service allowed them to do this they have here specifically the rules in which all competitors in the esports kind of operate uh they have a rule saying engaging in any act that in blizzard's sole discretion brings you into public dis- uh brings you into public disrepute offends a portion or group of the public or otherwise damages blizzard image will result in removal from grandmaster and reduction of the player's prize total to zero dollars in addition to other remedies which may be provided for under the handbook in blizzard's website terms so yeah they have a rule for this yeah they're following their rule but at the same time the group of people that they offended are the authoritarian Chinese government. It's not like they spoke out against, you know, with any kind of homophobic slurs. It's not like they spoke out against any kind of ethnic or minority group. Uh, anyone who's really oppressed, no, this is this was someone speaking out for a pro-democracy movement and was then censored because of the ties with China. Blizzard appears to be arguing that the statement about the Hong Kong protest uh, offended a portion of group of the public or damaged the company's image. Blizzard did not immediately respond to Business Insider's request for comments. The company has disabled comments on his blog post announcing the ban, which, again, just kind of leads people who want to talk about this kind of thing to other to other avenues they've taken to twitter they've taken to reddit they've taken to facebook they've taken to all these other forums to talk about the ban and the the compensation and by the way there's another company out there currently escapes my mind but they offered uh any lost portion of this gentleman's wages they said they were going to pay it themselves and they invited them to their competitor or uh, they are a direct competitor to Hearthstone, and they invited him out to uh, compete in their tournament. Obviously, a bit of a PR move, but at the same time, those kinds of PR moves should be completely uh, applauded. Now, a couple more minutes here. Uh, final thoughts on this whole thing. Uh, we are seeing, again, it's it's the entertainment part of, of America, and... You know, not just the entertainment, but really the technology part, which is what we're most concerned about. China is intrinsically intertwined in the tech market. They make everything. They control manufacturing. If you want to be competitive, you can't really compete on a global stage or even a U.S. stage if you don't outsource to China. It's just that when you have these issues of values, morals, and what have you, I think that if Americans and really Western culture don't stand up and say, you know, even though you don't like to talk about this kind of thing, this is something that actually matters to us as consumers. Because yes, the Chinese market is a large market, but... So is the Western market. So is the Eurozone. So is America. So is Canada. So is Mexico and South America. So are all of these other parts of the economy. And it really feels like these companies are saying, we would rather take the momentary PR kerfluffle, the momentary PR hit, 
and trade that for long-term economic success in China, even though you are completely compromising uh, freedom of speech, freedom of expression, the right to democracy, the right to peaceful protest, that kind of thing. Uh, if consumers don't say that this matters to us, then it kind of gives a green light for not just the companies, but the Chinese government to then dictate what is what is appropriate and what is not appropriate to discuss. And as we said, with the Chinese with the Chinese internet and the you know and the the rest of the world uh, and their internet, the more control you let them have over these large organizations, these companies, and really their viewer base about what can be censored and what can't be censored, the more they're going to take. I mean, China's not just happy with a little bit. They This is definitely a culture clash between these two ideals. Uh, this is the time to really kind of say, hey, you know, we need to stand up for this. Uh, so my response to all this I'm probably not going to boycott. I'm probably not going to take to the streets and riot. I'm probably not going to delete my account, my account in protest. Uh, that seems overkill for what happened here. Uh, but there does need to be a backlash on social media and what have you. And there does need to be some kind of response from Blizzard that says to some extent that we understand why you're upset. We understand what we did was wrong. And here's how we're going to move forward from here on. If as a company, they want to, you know, really, really set that in stone and really come out in either complete support of the Chinese government, then we can make our decision. But if they come out and say, you know, this was one incident, uh, we didn't handle this properly, we're going to reinstate this gentleman and we're going to give him his prize money, uh, we apologize for how we handled this, blah, 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 then, hey, you can definitely work forward from there. It's just, man, just so many moves so quickly by this attempt to censor Western media. It, it, it just seems so weird that it just happened one after another after another. And it will continue to happen um, as time goes on. And again, if you wanted to see a particular place where that's all the more, uh, you know, all the more obvious, yes, video games are going to be a huge one. But then on top of that, check out Hollywood in the movies. And trust me, you will see a lot of pandering to China and you will see a lot of uh, you know, no, nothing controversial when it comes to uh, things that the Chinese government does not want to be made public. Obviously, Computer America, having talked about all this, we are not brought to you by China or the Chinese government. Uh, we probably ruined our chances of ever, you know, having any kind of relationship with Blizzard or whatnot, but this was a topic that was pretty near and dear to my heart, so I... Uh, you know, I'm not going to say, I'm, I'm, I'm not going to, well, sit here, but I'm not going to sit here and lecture you about, you know, what the proper response to Hong Kong and Taiwan and, um, uh, all this kind of thing is. I just know that, uh, the lack of a conversation is worse than, you know, having the conversation. So there you go. There's that story. And again, by that story, I just kind of mean that group of stories that. Uh, it's definitely going to happen. And I'm actually looking forward to talking with uh, a, a particular correspondent, Nathan Evans, about that. I think he should be back on the show uh, this Friday. It should be very interesting to, uh, you know, to have someone else to bounce these ideas off of. Now, let's go ahead, lighten the mood a little bit, and see what we can do. Uh, that's not light. <laughs> okay, lighten the mood a little bit. How about this? This one's pretty fluffy. PlayStation, but not just any PlayStation, PlayStation 5 has officially been announced. That's right. And by the way, PlayStation 5 is the official name. I know you're, you were wondering if uh, PlayStation 1, 2, 3, 4 was going to be the end of it, but the PS5 looks to be the official name of the product. 
next holiday season. Not this holiday season, 2020 holiday season. Sony is offering up more drip feed details about its next generation console, but the major points are that yes, it will be called the PlayStation 5, and you'll have to wait till the end of 2020 to play it. On top of that, we also got the first new details of the new controllers for Sony's next game machine. Think haptics, a few of them. So, uh, this article again from Engadget, Matt Smith, saying that uh, the new controller, Sony is talking up a new haptic feedback feature to replace the typical rumble effect found in the PlayStation controller for decades. It sounds more like high-level rumble features that Nintendo brought on board with the Switch, but never quite found a place for. On the PlayStation 5 controller, its shakes will offer a wider range of rumbles, and the company is going so far as to claim a sense of touch so refined you can feel the difference between walking through a field of grass and plodding through mud somehow. And I think the way that that happens is that obviously you have you have your two joysticks, you have your uh, your game uh, controller in your hand, and before it would just you know it's it, it's normally just attached to a to a spring, and you would press forward on the joystick, you'd move forward. The only thing I can think of is that they're replacing the basic springs with some kind of haptic, some kind of haptic motor that is definitely going to make the controllers more expensive, but much more responsive. And it's going to give you just that little bit of pushback as you move the controller forward so that if you're just walking on plain, even level ground, it's going to feel like nothing. It's going to feel like usual. And then if you're walking through, let's say, mud or your character's walking through mud, then that joystick will be a little bit harder to push forward. Now, adaptive triggers are the are the other major update and will come with L2 and, and R2 buttons. Game, uh, game developer can provide the... Uh, I'm, I'm sorry. Game developers can program the give of these buttons to represent in-game tension and force, like drawing a bowstring or in or in car acceleration. The prototype controller itself apparently still looks a lot like the PS4's DualShock 4 and it will apparently be charged through USB-C 2. So I guess the thing there is that traditionally uh, the triggers, especially the L2 R2 buttons, uh, they have always been like most buttons, an analog option. You press a button, you give a command. Uh, it's not really so so much about if you jam mash the A button or I guess PlayStation the square button. Uh, it's not so much if you jam the square button or lightly tap it or quickly press it. I mean, three presses is three presses. It's just on or off. Uh, now we're getting the same thing, uh, whatever kind of technology they're able to implement in the joysticks, you're getting at with the triggers, and the triggers will have that little bit of feedback to, again, give you the difference between maybe shooting a weapon and uh, accelerating in a car. I think it's pretty cool. Uh, they said that there will be an SSD drive that has, that has been confirmed yet again, but a different way of installing games could be just as useful for games well, gamers, that constantly updated games. Rather than treating games like a big block of data, we're allowed the finer grain access to the data. That could mean that you grab only the multiplayer part of a game or download a portion of the game of the single player experience so you can get to playing as quickly as possible. Rest assured, physical games will still exist on PS5 coming on 100 gigabytes optical discs on a new drive that doubles as a 4K Blu-ray player. So, looks like we're sticking with the 4K Blu-ray. The uh, the lack of a physical drive is not something confirmed. There still there will still be physical discs, but uh, looks like a bigger emphasis on being able to download your games. Uh, Pretty cool. Again, uh, the big point here is that PlayStation 5 will be coming next year, which is kind of the flag for the race to begin and for Xbox to come up with theirs. Obviously, Xbox already had... Oh, are we up to Project Scarlet? 
but yeah, uh, Xbox already leaked a couple of things about their next generation console. PlayStation has officially announced that they will have a next gen console in 2020. That will be the year to look for. So, yep, there you go. A new way to handle all of those games. Okay, so there's that one. How about we go ahead and continue on? Uh, how about we talk about <laughs> what's interesting? This new movie. I I unfortunately just haven't seen all that many, well, all that many previews for it. But I've seen a few. Gemini Man. Gemini Man, uh, I believe it star, uh, stars Will Smith. And I think it has his, uh, well, actually, uh, it's not his son. I, I actually thought it, it was uh, 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 Jaden Smith. But no, Will Smith plays a clone played by a young, completely digital version of Will Smith. So it's not just Will Smith, but it's Will Smith starring or co-starring with Will Smith. Uh, which, you know, hey, uh, Tyler Perry uh, kind of pioneered that, so take it what you will but check this one out i thought this is pretty interesting from a technology point of view no movie theater in america will play gemini man as it was meant to be seen saying that but a few theater goers will get the full 120 frames per second experience that's right we have moved far far away from the conversation about 24 frames per second, 30 frames per second, 60 frames per second, things like that. Now we are all the way up to 120 frames per second. And just with this movie. So really, if, if you want the way that it was meant to be watched, you're probably going to have to wait till you can get it at home. Because it's meant. Uh, they captured it and they were able to uh, release it at 120 frames per second 4k 3d in order to bridge the uncanny valley between will smith and his co-star a clone played by will smith who is a digital actor the director who previously pushed the limitations of cinematic visuals uh they you know including uh, the life of pi uh intends for the hfr projection to make the unrealistic look hyper realistic Except most people won't see the fruit of his labor when the movie, well, uh, releases this Friday. Saying that they confirm with representatives from Paramount Pictures and Dolby Cinema that only 14 U.S. theaters will project Will Smith's new action thriller in 120 frames per second 3D. But here's the thing. Movie theaters are still only 2K. That's right. Not even 4K. Uh, many IMAX theaters out there still only do 2K. Uh, most IMAX theaters out there will do uh, 60 frames per second and not even 3D viewing. And if it does do 3D viewing, you can be darn sure it's not 120 frames per second. So they said that despite the movie shooting uh, at 120 frames per second, 4K, 3D, uh, I'm sure 4K, 3D, HDR, OMG, LOL, whatever, uh, no theater in America will technically play the film as he intended, but some will come close. Here's the full list, and here in the article from Polygon, they have a list of all the different movies. Uh, I'm sorry, all the different AMC theaters that will have it, and don't get me wrong, you know, a lot of different markets, a couple in Florida, a couple in California, a couple, or, you know, Chicago, Illinois, Atlanta, Georgia, uh, Las Vegas has one, but only a handful, only about a dozen, or I should say 14 movie theaters can actually do this. Uh, yeah, so at the time, uh, they said it's fair. People will be intimidated, or I'm sorry, uh, intimidated by the 3D and more data and more details. It can be scary, and most people won't try it, but it also gave us more material to work with. We had 40 times more data, which meant 40 times more chance of flopping or succeeding. You just have more to work with, and in 3D, it's sharper. Because of that, it made me want to do this. You can't put it on makeup or erase wrinkles or have his son play him and call that a clone. There you go. So the gravitational pull of Netflix and the pristine viewing of the home theater environment is real, but he hopes that Gemini Man will vindicate his experiment, saying that the scary part is that TV is ahead of movies. And he's, he, he's right, you know, from a director's point of view, uh, the theater is supposed to be 
the place where you invest all of your technology, you invest all of the latest advancements in viewing and entertainment experience because, hey, you know, you can centralize it in one place. It's a lot cheaper than every individual being able to do that. But nowadays, getting a, a 144 hertz 4K monitor costs you like, what, 250 bucks? Don't get me wrong. That's a lot of money. That's a lot of money for a monitor. But at the same time, if it's better, if it's, you know, it may not be as grand as movie theater, but if it's technically better than the movie theater down the street, you have less and less incentive to actually go into the theater. So again, from a technology standpoint, I found that very interesting that only a few, only a handful of theaters are actually capable of playing these, uh, you know, playing this movie the way it was shot and the way it was meant to be seen. So there you go. Uh, let's go ahead and continue on here. Um, okay. Let's go ahead and talk about this one. Uh, this gentleman, I really feel like is someone that everyone should hear about because his heart was in the right place. Uh, what he was doing, I really feel like he was the victim of success because if he only did this for a couple of people if he only did this like he if, if he kept really low and under the radar he probably would not have been arrested and he would not be serving uh he would not be serving a year and serving a year in prison for what you may ask well it's for making and selling twenty eight thousand copies of microsoft well well, I should say Microsoft res Restore CDs, a disk that lets users uh, restore their computers to factory settings. Microsoft gives these disks away for free on the internet, but the company testified in court and, uh, that the gentleman had conspired to traffic in counterfeit goods and infringed on copyright. That's right. This is a service or these are disks that Microsoft will give you for free if you have a version of Windows. And really, that's what he was dealing with. He was dealing with bootleg version of Windows. And that's why Microsoft got involved, took him to court and won through legal action. And so uh, they have a quote here from the gentleman. He's saying that I got in the way of the 28th largest company in the world and this giant stepped on me and I felt it. I'm going to prison for giving you the free repair tool to fix what you legally own. So they said that he built a business refurbishing computers in the Pacific Northwest, which prevents them from becoming e-waste. Uh, we had a company here at the beginning of the year to talk about e-waste. E-waste is such, such a horrible industry that, um, you know, even though there are these quote unquote proper recycling facilities, there's no guarantee that this e-waste actually gets to where it's going and beyond that uh, for the U.S. to sell its e-waste to other companies. A lot of that just ends up polluting places that are not America. E-waste is a huge, huge problem. Uh, we're getting a handle on it. It's not there yet. So being able to reduce that in a meaningful way is hugely important. Now, with that being said, as part of his business, this gentleman wanted to offer customers an easy method of restoring their computer to its factory settings. Manufacturers such as Microsoft and Dell typically uh, include restore CDs with the purchase of a new computer, but people tend to lose them. And so Lundgren uh, identified a niche and contracted with a company in China to mass produce the disk for his customers. I think that's where he really ran afoul, is that if he's really helping that many people, he's not using a CD burner in his basement and he's not burning 100 CDs a day. No. He contracted with China to order uh, thousands, thousands and thousands of these bootleg uh, restore CDs, which, by the way, eh, aren't really that interesting. I, I mean, you know, I, I can kind of get it for movies, for music, for albums, for, uh, you know, TV shows, things like that. Yeah, that cuts into profits. But for a computer operating system restore CD, that is... In a lot of cases, Microsoft doesn't even provide anymore, especially if they're like Windows XP or Windows 2000 or Windows uh, 95 or Windows 7. Microsoft is not too keen on providing you factory restore CDs for those operating systems. 
Uh, they said that uh, when the manufacturer shipped this to America, they sat unused in a warehouse for two years. A middleman uh, that the gentleman had dealt with before called him up and asked to buy the disc for a total of about $3,400. It was a sting. Who knew? And Wolf was working for the federal government and authorities raided his house. After a five-year court battle, he pleaded guilty to conspiracy to traffic in counterfeit goods and copyright infringement. There you go. And the justice system coming in swinging, uh, doing what it does best. Quote from uh, from Lundgren saying, quote, do I regret my actions? No, I do not. Case over, boys. We did it. Good job, everyone. I'm kidding. The quote continues. I think the history will find that Microsoft are on the wrong side of humanity when it comes to recycling. My mistake was thinking too small. I thought if I could just help people repair 100,000 computers and make them last a couple years longer, that would make a big difference. So the court sentenced him to 15 months, but he was released after a year for good behavior. Saying, quote, I don't know what I was supposed to learn by going to prison. I just made the most of my time while I was there. They try to break you in prison. That's basically what prison is set up to do. I would say my time in prison definitely emboldened me further towards my goal, which is to see that all e-waste in, uh, in the country and the world isn't thrown away, but is indeed recycled. And really, I, I really applaud the guy because this is what we need uh, we have seen the e-waste and the e and the e-waste recycling apparatus really doesn't work all that well uh it gets sent overseas dumped bought by the ton and overall is just either burned incinerated uh which pollutes the local environment and overall just is just not a good solution uh this is a big part of the Linux community and the open, you know, kind of the open source community where they're very invested in getting computers to have a purpose after life. You know, even though, yes, it's a 10 year old computer and you can think, well, what else can I do with this thing? Who says that computer can't become uh, something as simple as, let's just say, a media player or hooked up to, uh, you know, or hooked up to a router and make it your uh, you know, kind of like the controls, the control center for all of your network attached storage. Like there are ways to turn these computers into useful products, but companies just aren't all that interested. Microsoft, uh, you know, Microsoft and Dell and whoever sells you your particular computer, they really don't care that you could get maybe seven to 10 years out of a computer. No, they want you to buy a new one every three to five years, if not even sooner than that. Uh, getting them to last longer may be good for the environment, but bad for the profits. That's where he's coming in. That's why he feels no remorse. And again, that's why I really feel like uh, his story needed to be told. So. I hope that he stays out of prison. Definitely don't want him back in prison, but uh, you can tell he's even more motivated than ever to tackle uh, e-waste. Now, let's talk about Samsung. Let's get a little heady with profits, and this has to do with markets and profits and analysts and things like that, uh, which I find very interesting because Samsung is one of those companies that... You hear all the time, they have great presence of mind, but at the same time, even though they live in your head for free, well, the South Korean conglomerate expects another profit slump for a three-month period that ended in September. Check it out. They say that it believes they will post an operating profit of about 7.7 .7 trillion Korean won, which, before you get too excited, is about $6.4 billion dollars. It's a lot of money. That's higher than the 6.6 .6 trillion won profit that they made in the second quarter, but it's also 56% from the same period in 2018, where the company made about 17.57 trillion dollar or trillion won, which works out to about 14 billion dollars. That's right. In just under a year, they have lost about half of their revenue. That's a pretty big deal. 
So let's get to the bottom of this. This one coming to us from Engadget, Mariella Moon, saying that the tech giant will reveal more details about the state of the company when it releases its full earnings report. But they mentioned Samsung's forecast is correct, then this will be the third consecutive quarter where the operating profit is halved from the same period a year ago. Saying that it even published a warning before it released its earning guidance for the quarter of 2019 to prepare investors as early as possible. It must be pretty bad when you're going to say, all right, guys, here it comes. Don't panic. And turns out everyone had a reason to panic anyways. So they cited plummeting chip prices and slower chip demand at that time, which are issues that continue to plague not just Samsung, but other chip makers. Samsung's chip business has been its biggest moneymaker in a while, so the lack of demand for memory chips worldwide is hurting the company finances. Uh, however, they said that things are going to improve for the industry, and Samsung actually enjoyed better than expected memory shipments in the third quarter. So memory, and by the way, memory means RAM. So RAM prices are down if you're looking for, um, let's see. So if you're looking for cheap RAM, now is a pretty good time to, uh, you know, to take advantage of it. Uh, and by the way, just wanted to look it up here real quick. And yeah, let's go ahead and take a look at this uh, particular chart that they have here. Let's see, copy and paste. If you're watching the video portion, you can see it here. This is for Corsair Vengeance RAM. Uh, 8 gig, which is two 4, four gig sticks, DDR3 1600 megahertz, blah, blah, blah. But essentially, you can see the price here where it's been plummeting, plummeting over the course of the year, and it's only now starting to creep back. But it went from about 126 bucks all the way down to almost $36 over the course of a year. That's just... Well, I should say over the course of like two years. So when the most profitable part of your company sees a decrease where, you know, you go about a quarter of what you were expecting, you can sell twice as much as you did the year prior, but you're still only going to make half as much money. So again, their shipments were up, but the overall price is still way, 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 way down. There you go. Uh Samsung, they're they're going to be okay. There's no doubt in my mind that Samsung is going to be okay. It's just going to hurt for a little bit. Uh, we have time for just one more story here. And let's see, we're going to have them on the show. So don't feel the need to talk about that. How about we discuss... All right, th this one's pretty quick. Mirror. Yes, like mirror, mirror on the wall. Mirror launches live training sessions that let coaches see you at home, and each session will cost about 40 bucks. Judging by the, uh, you know, judging by the environment that uh, the picture for the article is coming from, I don't know how many people are going to be paying for $40 a month. So interactive fitness company Mirror, which makes a reflective LCD display for following workouts at home, today announced it's launching one-on-one -on -one personal training. Through two-way audio and video, coaches will be able to lead users through sessions while giving feedback. Users can choose trainers based on workout activity preferences, yoga, strength training, uh, strength training so on and so forth, uh, session length, trainer, motivational style, and schedule. At $40 a session, that's pricier than SoulCycle class, but still a fraction of the cost of a session with a personal trainer at most gyms. Hmm. Uh, so it's a 40-inch, 100, uh, well, 100, 1080p vertical display that will set you back about $1,500, and the monthly content service, which has 70 new live classes a week, is required to take part in the personal training course, saying that's an extra 40 bucks a month in addition to each $40 personal trainer event. So they have a camera, a microphone, they'll 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 watch you, that kind of thing. But there you go. Uh, although nothing can replace an in-person experience at a gym where a personal trainer can help modify your form and act as a partner for some workouts, Mirror is part of a growing trend of companies working to use technology and people to give you something like that at home. ClassPass and Peloton, for example. Uh, Mayor CEO said that he's confident that the home will always be the most convenient place to work out. 
And he, he says that it's fun that the session lets you choose train your motivational style as well. Some days you need a coach yelling, encouraging things at you while you work out from the comfort of your home. So there you go. I guess you could pick like a really mean, nasty coach or a smooth talking, comforting one. I don't know. But yeah, there you go. I, uh, yeah, found that one pretty interesting. And by the way, everyone, uh, just one last time, if you didn't hear, uh, the entire show, wherever podcasts are heard, be it Stitcher, Apple, Google, you know, iHeartRadio, so on and so forth, Spreaker, uh, give it a listen and thank you, thank you, thank you for tuning in to IRN. Thank you for tuning in to twitch.tv forward slash computer America. Find the full show notes at computeramerica.com. Be sure to check us out. And in the meantime, everyone have a great day. I want to thank you so much for tuning in. Uh, a lot of very interesting conversations we had today and if i offended anyone if i made anyone mad upset please feel free to reach out wherever whichever social media that you would like to discuss this with more than happy to at computer america or at our website or live at computeramerica.com send us a message send us an email until next time we hope you do well we hope that you tune back in everyone catch you next time monday through friday 4 p.m to 5 p.m eastern Bye, everyone. Have a good one.